to Century Guild Salon. I'm Kat Handler. I am so excited tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of exciting, really inspiring artwork. Sorry about that, guys. Had a little technical moment there. <laughs> Um, thank you so much to those of you who are here with us live right now and joining our discussion tonight. And um, if you're tuning in after the recording, welcome. Um, I hope this is just as exciting to you as well. Uh, tonight we are going to be discussing some of my favorite poster artworks from the books Century Guild has published. But before we get into that, I would like to introduce our gallery founder and author, Tom Nagobin. Hello. Well, hello, Kat. It's <laughs> nice to see you again. I always like to give you a formal introduction. As soon as uh, the screen went black, I just yelled to Chandra, do you think Kat knows she's not on screen? Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> it's very clear to me that something was wrong. So hopefully we're, we're smooth sailing from here on out. Uh, I see that you're in a new uh, setting, a new location. Yeah, we don't want to talk about it. So I, I can see you are too. You're clearly inside uh, the belly of a clown. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, without further ado, we are going to be exploring some really, as I said, very inspiring artworks. And we're going to go chronologically uh, through the artworks that I have selected. And I'm well, sure. So I have a question. Sure. Uh, so when we were trying to figure out what we were going to do tonight, I said that you should, uh, you should pick your 10 favorite posters. And I'm curious what criteria you used to select these gems. Well, 10 favorite posters that we've published in one of our books was, was the criteria to be clear. But so yeah, what was your criteria? I, I was sort of vacillating between, do I do the ones that I just, that bring me joy personally? Do I pick the ones that are a little, you know, I have some academic interest in? And mm. I, I sort of settled more on what, the things that I personally really love to look at and I find personally very exciting. Okay. I'm sure we could do, I mean, we could talk for three hours about the artworks I love from our books, but these are just ones that just have a special place in my heart. And it, it, I will admit it was very hard to pick 10. I'm sure if you asked me to pick 10 tomorrow, there would be some changes, but long story long, that was my criteria. Okay. So I can, let's see here. I am going to pull up our first one and here we go. So this is one of the artworks I selected from, uh, this one was Infernal Creatures. So are we going to go in chronological order? Oh, we are. You know what? I, I'm sorry. We are going to do that. And I, from 1920. Yes. Well, chronologically backwards, maybe. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, everyone. It's okay. I, I just had him in a weird, a weird order there. Okay. Let me correct. What you've got. Hmm? I said, let's see what you've got. All right. That makes more sense. Oh, that's a good one. Mm hmm. So this is actually was published in Le Pater. It is Carlos Schwab's 1892 poster for the first Salon Rosa Croix. And I, I don't know if, if it would be more interesting for me to explain why I selected this or if you had any insight you wanted to share about the poster first. I'll give you guys a little detail here. Well, why don't you tell me why you why you like it? I I love that. When's the, the first time you saw it? Do you remember the first time you saw it? It may have been 
when we were putting together the the hardcover Le Pater um, prior to its 2019 release. Okay. Um, and so I that that was the context in which it was introduced to me. Okay. And and the thing I find one of the things I find beautiful about this because it's it's such an amazing artwork is the symbolism of ascension that you see here. And I know you talk about it in Le Pater as well, mm -hmm. but it, you know, you have this figure here at the bottom who's sort of mired in this swamp. And then you have the two who are sort of gradually becoming more and more weightless and ethereal as they ascend. And um, it's, it's just a beautiful allegory for spiritual growth. Well, in 1892, poster art, as we think of it today, hadn't really developed yet. Um, there were a lot of uh, artists that were working um, in a more monochromatic realm. That is not why this is monochromatic. That is purely an artistic decision for him. But I mean that in terms of like when we think about French posters and things like that, and we think about color and a lot of things like that. In 1892, a lot of what you saw was a lot more primitive, a lot of big, bold letters and then um, some graphics that maybe looked like engravings or things like that. So Carlos Schwab, he was young when he made this, um, the poster is, God, I mean, maybe six feet tall, maybe just over. Um, and I used to sleep with this at the foot of my bed so that every morning the sunlight would come in on this. And this is what I saw every morning. Wow. And the Salon Rosacroix was definitely the glam, rock and roll, Parisian, salon that that was a bunch of people immersed in the ideas of spiritualism but as it collided with metaphysics and uh culture so it wasn't nearly as much a religious sentiment as it was um philosophical but even more so, like the, it, it skewed very young in the sense of it was very, I, you know, I just said it, but it's, it was very rock and roll. Like it was very much uh, like the place to be when they uh, had their first exhibition. I think they expected a few hundred people and tens of thousands over the, the course of the, you know, the couple weeks or whatever. Um, and Carlos Schwab had done some book illustration at this time. He did do some really amazing paintings. He was uh, born in Germany, moved to Switzerland, and then settled in Paris. And then as he was new in Paris, this was one of the first things that, that came onto his plate. But he only made a couple posters, I think. There's two I can think of. He might have made more, but off the top of my head, there's two. Mm -hmm. And so he um, he was thinking about poster art, not as an advertiser, but in the way a painter would, in terms of message and theme and symbolism. And so what he did here, as you explained, is it's the idea that you have humanity caught in the trap of the mundane and the idea that she's kind of melting into this mire down at the bottom mm -hmm. is the idea that that is just the physical state of existence and the acolyte who's holding the lily of purity is taking the hand of grace and wisdom and ascending the stairs toward i don't you know it's not necessarily heaven but it's it's the ideal of heaven the ideal of a uh, utopian state of uh, of alchemy um and so that's that's basically what this is if i keep talking we're not going to have enough time to I do <laughs> all your posters but it's a, it's a great one and it's a, definitely one of my favorites 
there's a small version in Le Maitre de la Fiche that you can find on eBay all the time for like probably 80 bucks. And it's because it's such a big, grand poster in person. And then when you see the little one, it is really beautiful. But everyone, if they're flipping through bins or they see it anywhere, they always overlook it because it's monochromatic and next to a MUCA or a Lautrec, it just disappears. So you could get, I think it would have been printed in like 1896 or so, the small maitre de la fiche of this. So someone who loves this and wants to really look at a period lithograph and see all of the detail, that is uh, one that you could locate probably quite easily and extremely affordably. That is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, folks. So next we have, oh my gosh, this is one of my all time favorites. I'm really, uh, I'm really getting everybody ready. <laughs> I feel like it should be a game show. You should yeah. like, give me clues and then I'll guess what it's going to be. Yes. Oh. Yes. So this is just, this is an advertisement, if you can believe it. It's 1894. Um, it's an 1894 poster for salad oil by Jan Tura. And I... Where did you first see this one? This was... Again, we were preparing flowering lines, and that's when I first saw this. I, I don't remember seeing it prior to that. And um, I just... I, I think... Part of what I find so exciting about this is how psychedelic it is. And I mean, another monochromatic poster, interestingly enough, but there's so much mindful psychedelia going on um, yeah. that makes any sense. And it, it, there's a sense of humor to it too that I find so interesting. But most of all, I think... I was trying to put my finger on it. And I think it's making reality fantastical is, okay. is what Jan Torop did here. It took something as mundane as salad oil and made it something larger than life. Well, I would say that this is... Um... It's a questionable advertisement in the sense of it's extraordinarily memorable, which does make it a positive advertisement. Mm -hmm. But the things that make it memorable are Turop and not anything to do with the product. So people, it actually in Amsterdam, in the 1890s, um, they would call Art Nouveau salad oil style because this was such a quintessential image mm -hmm. and so powerful and so uh, celebrated and famous. His paintings are amazing. He was born in Java, which was a Dutch colony, and then later moved to Amsterdam. Um, and so the thing that you see in his paintings that's hinted at here is that he created a, a lot of artworks that had the idea that humans are connected to the earth. And so maybe he'll, he'll paint a woman and her hair becomes these lines that then become the trees. And then those trees become roots and you see those roots come up and then they become the veins in the woman. And so the idea that humanity and nature was connected put him closer to being a, a quintessential proponent of the Art Nouveau style in a way that all of the French artists really struggled with. Like he just did it naturally. Everything he did was so, so powerful and beautiful and really connected to that idea of our relationship with nature. The reason I made the comment about it being questionable as advertising is it just he didn't tackle anything with the 
advertisement that they could have utilized later, perhaps in an ad campaign. The success of this is purely based on his genius. And much like the one we looked at before this, I, th I think it's because he's a painter who looked at the world in a very, very different way. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just, it's another very, very famous poster that uh, is, is really quintessential of the era. It's a little more obscure, but uh, mm -hmm. and again, in Amsterdam, they called Art Nouveau salad oil style because this poster was so popular. That is so cool and charming. And yeah. Sparks made a great comment. Um, Boris says, the texture in those shadowed folds is amazing when you zoom in. Agreed. I mean, that doesn't look like lithography. I mean, this is what, is this a two color poster? Look, this, I think just this is a two color poster, yes. Yeah, because I mean, you have the gradations of the, the yeah. gray. Like the salon poster looks like Carlos Schwab's art. He did a lot of monochromatic because he was a, did a lot of book illustrations. Mm -hmm. Turop used a lot more colors than this. That could have been just a financial call. It could have been, you know, every color you used was more expensive because these were done with huge limestones. Mm -hmm. So that could have literally been just a budgetary decision. But, you know, he, he used it beautifully. He did. And uh, Forrest also says um, he thought it was going to be an ad for absinthe, which goes back to your comment about it not being necessarily the best. I mean, yeah, it does look like if you use this salad oil that you're going to, I mean, what's going to happen? It looks like you're going to. You're going to have a great hair day. <laughs> you're going to have an absinthe experience. And yeah. hello, Forrest. Um, but yeah, let's, what's your third one? All right. I'm going to let you tell some jokes. I'm going to pull this next one up. Okay. So this is an amazing artwork. I already know that you love this one. So this is, um, I believe, 1895 um, Glasgow Institute of the Arts by the, the famous The Four. Yes, The Four. Um, so this one uh, is, it's early, right? What is 18? 1895, I believe. 1895. Um, <clears throat> so this is, so the Glasgow Four, this is at a weird time in history. This is, this is right when Mooka was coming up. And at this time... The, the Glasgow Four were, were pretty pretty brutally critiqued. Um, they called their art ghoul-like because they had these very androgynous, uh, you know, it's almost hermetic in their depictions of, of the figure. And it was very much uh, in contrast to what people like Mooka or Jules Charest were doing, which were these very exaggerated uh, feminizations and so the idea that you have kind of this specter of art coming over this woman, but like, look at her hair. It's just one piece. It's if you look at it, like zoom way in on it. Like if you remove the context, it's not as attractive. It almost looks art deco when you, when you back and look at her fingers and look at that flower. It's a little sinister. And so the four uh, were, were called, they called their nickname in the press was the spook school because everything they did was just so strange. Uh, and the thing that to me is most notable about the Glasgow four, this is the three of them without Charles Rennie Macintosh. Um, so Herbert McNair and then the McDonald sisters, Francis and, um, Margaret, Margaret McDonald. Mm -hmm. The thing to, to me is it, it definitely informed, like, look at those vertical flowers. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And think of like Germany in 1905. Think of like Colum and Moser. Think of the secessionists. Yes. I, I was going to ask you if this influenced uh, the Darmstadt artists, because that looks like that Darmstadt. A, a little bit. Darmstadt, the, the best, it's less, it's less Darmstadt and more German. It's less Darmstadt and more secessionism because Darmstadt was a little more rooted in arts and crafts. Darmstadt was an arts colony. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a whole other story that we don't want to get into if we want to make this an hour. It's really cool, but we won't do it here. The thing to me about the Glasgow Four that is the most interesting is that everyone thinks of Art Nouveau and they think of the 1900s. And it's kind of like when your dad starts listening to the band you like. That the World's Fair in 1900 was really the big coming out party, the debutante ball for Art Nouveau. Mm -hmm. But it really was done at that point. 1894, 1895, 1896, you had this whirlwind of Art Nouveau. And this was right in the middle of that. It really didn't fit. But in 1902, the next major world exhibition after the World's Fair in Paris, the Exposition Universal, was the 1902 exhibition in Turin in Italy. Mm -hmm. And at that fair, the Glasgow Four exhibited, and that was where the world said, this is what we're doing next. So the reason when you see Colum and Moser doing those really psychedelic palettes, but they're really geometric, mm -hmm. some of that is 1901, but what you really see is that 1902 the entire direction of, of the bus shifts. And so there were other artists like the secessionists that were doing this, but they were the ones that were kind of the bell of the ball in Turin in 1902. And what they were doing is what they were doing here. It just took, it's kind of like with a great band or something. It just took the world seven years to catch up. Right. So in 1895, people looked at this and they made fun of it. They called it the spook school. They called it ghoul, like I said, you know. Right. Um, it, because it's not, it doesn't have that softness. And there was no soft. Look at those flowers on the side of it. It looks like a stained glass window. But even then, stained glass, I'm saying that from a modern perspective. Mm -hmm. Stained glass windows at that time would have been extremely, you know, classical church. Mm -hmm stained glass but the fact that they were thinking that way they were thinking in geometric shapes it's it's with the best of peter barons and column and moser and mm -hmm. those kind of designers so this is a great one um this particular photo is of an image that was printed in 1897 in a smaller format um which the the large one is gigantic uh and it is not one we've ever owned. This one came from the smaller format. So this is also one that is available uh, in a couple different versions that are really, really beautiful. But it's 823. We should. Uh, yeah, I just. I'm I, so sorry. <laughs> I just want to say real quick, I, I one of the things I loved about this work in particular was how I, I I'm hesitant to use the word masculine, but how avant-garde and angular it is. Um, I just, I find that so beautiful in the design. Okay. That's, I think that has to do with the lithography because mm -hmm. two of the three artists that worked on that were women. Their style was very, very feminine in its curves, but I think that it was, um, it was very much the, a precursor by decades of what we would call art deco. Mm -hmm. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's masculine. I would say that it's essentialized or simplified. Okay. All right. So next up is another amazing uh, advertisement artwork by Henry Vandeveld. Uh, and this was published in Flowering Lines as well. And, um, this was, this is an egg, an egg advertisement, right? Or an egg white product of some kind. 
Um, the poster says the most concentrated nourishment. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that it's, uh, it's a, a protein, uh, what's the word? Um, supplement. supplement. It's like an extract from egg whites. I see. I believe it was like a powder. Sign me up, man. Yeah. I mean, look at, uh, this is, this is part of what blows me away. I'm, oops, sorry. I'm getting a little excited here. You've got, again, simplified color palette, but look at the washes of the yellow. It just looks painterly. Well, this one was not printed in a traditional manner. Um, I am not certain about this, but I believe that they were printed more like wood blocks. Oh. I would have to research this. Uh, I was told that it was a wood block technique, but I don't know this for certain. Uh, Henry van de Velde or Henri was Belgian and he, a lot of his design w was in realms of physical things, uh, architecture, silverware. You know, he definitely thought in three dimensions more so than a, a two dimensional poster. This is, um, I will say this, this is a funny regret of mine in that when we had this post, it was very early in my years as a dealer. And the price that we were able to sell it for was not commensurate with my love for it. Meaning it, I was able to market at a higher price than, than me wanting to keep it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand it well enough at the time. I knew it was significant and important, but I think at that time I was a little more connected to works that were more illustrative because this is, I mean, maybe 20 years ago that I had this. Um, and I, yeah, I think I just, it didn't quite fit with like the other works that I had at this time that then I did keep were like the La Pater of the woman floating with the creatures around her, which is very illustrative. And then uh, I was buying a couple Italian pieces mm -hmm. um, like this Fiamma Firi behind me. And so I was really into the, I guess it's kind of the trap, right? Detail. We look at that and it's very painterly. And this was so essentialized and I didn't understand how extraordinary and it, it is and how difficult to take those eggs cracking open, making that pearlized egg white look at the bottom. Uh, I mean, I'm impressed that this is one that you love. It is not one that I, I loved early on, um, but I absolutely adore now. And if I, yeah, if I had it now, it's not one that I would want to sell because it is so, so good. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to say anything about it except just that it's an extraordinary design. I love the fact that it's not squared off at the top. Oh, yeah. You know, like all those things, it was very kind of like Turop. Like he was so connected to not the idea of, oh, I'm going to make beautiful long hair, but like what is the point of nature, like mm -hmm. on a cellular level? Oh, yeah. And, and so not mercenary at all for an advertisement. I mean, it would, I would make the point again, like, I can't imagine he, they used this in packaging. They used his designs for that. He was one of those artists like Peter Barron's that did everything, mm -hmm. but I can't imagine anyone looking at this and understanding it as much as it was just part of that culture in Belgium at the time 
which was that all of this really incredible art was happening uh, that was changing the way people looked at the world. It was just very stylized and essential. We got to move on. It's I know, I just, only three posters in. I know. I, I just want to say, looking at this in terms of illustration, if you're looking at a blank piece of paper or a canvas, I, I mean, to come up with this, this is a work of genius. How do you think about having this little floopy floop here and coming down and swooping and everything has its perfect place and, and the movement is- Well, look, look in the left on the middle where the ES and then the S turns into that curve. Mm -hmm. You know, like you don't even notice that. Like it's just every part of it just flows together really beautifully. Yeah, it's it's absolutely impressive and stunning. You're okay. impressive and stunning, Kat. Thanks, I try. <laughs> okay, so wow, this is great. We are moving on to a very different style. This is 1898. Uh, one of my favorite artists who I personally feel very inspired by. Um, this is Le Roar by Eugene Carrier. And um, that's a weird favorite poster. It's. <laughs> I. Oops. This is one that I felt my. When I chose this poster, a lot of it was just because I love Eugene Carrier so much. Okay. But it, it also is just. And, and that's not to say that because it's monk like that makes it better. I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but it, it is yeah. very monk like Yeah, and very it, much so. The thing I love about his art is um, how diaphanous it is. It's kind of like you know, in David Lynch's films, sometimes he turns the lighting down so it's almost black. And, and the figures that was, that was a critique of his work. <clears throat> One critic complained that looking at uh, an exhibition of Carrier paintings would be like just being in a room filled with smoke. <laughs> well, because everything I, is so monochromatic in these wispy shadows, you know. You know, but, each her own. But I just find that so dramatic and moving. Like yeah. you see this this figure, and I don't know if this figure is distraught, terrified, moved, ecstatic. I don't know exactly what what is being uh, forced as shades of Ingmar Bergman. Yes, totally, absolutely. I mean, I, would, I mean, I would say inspired. You know, the, mm -hmm. it was it was an artistic periodical. It mm -hmm. translates to the dawn, and. It was uh, it was a famous journal that uh, the thing they're most famous for is. Do you know what the Dreyfus affair is? I must have read about it because it's the, reading about the, the, the no. Dreyfus affair was. It was one of the biggest political scandals of the late nineteenth century. It's a also a, a like a landmark of anti-Semitism. Basically, a military uh, figure was accused and railroaded and then evidence came out that would have absolved him. And meanwhile, he's rotting on Devil's Island. And then a military uh, tribunal suppressed the information and Emile Zola wrote a very, very, very famous letter called I Accuse. And so, you know, Je Accuse, you know, the band Wang Chung? Wang Chung, the singer of that band, Jack Hughes, his pseudonym is based on Jacques. Wow. I was wondering how you were going to connect. How we're going to get into Wang Chang. <laughs> Love Wang Chang. Uh, but so the, the, the title, you know, J apostrophe accuse exclamation point is just a famous, famous thing. And it was something that completely polarized French society. It was literally the biggest political issue of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, L'Aurora was where it was 
posted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so it was, it was a place for enlightenment. And, uh, and again, Carrier is everything that he did was, was very magical in terms of, uh, shadows moving together and you're spot on that to me i always felt like it was a very pensive version in contrast to monk's violence like the scream is so in your face and everything carrier did is in this kind of palette it's mm -hmm. like he only bought brown paint brown and black i mean please if if you are taken by this style or just love Ingmar Bergman or David Lynch, please look at his work. They're also very feminine. Like he he did, uh, everything's very meditative. There's a lot of things about motherhood, a lot of things about femininity. So this fits very much with his, with his uh, body of work. I actually bought a carrier painting once. Really? I did. And I put a deposit down on it and then I just couldn't afford... Mm -hmm. To, to buy it. <laughs> I, I get it. I let the deposit go. It was just too, but I, I was moved and then it was just such a terrible. You got carried away. I got carried away. Yeah, it happens to the best of us. Oh, man. All right. So great. Okay. So. We are so not getting through your 10 posters. This will be volume one. Volume one. Well, we've got a lot of great stuff to look at. You can't just blow through it. Oh. Okay. So now we're getting into German expressionism. Hmm. This is 1918 or 19, 1919. 1919. Yes. And um, this is the German release poster for, uh, for the Dan poster Dan. over my shoulder right here. Yes, yes, that's the American one behind yeah. Tom, and this is the German release by Joseph Fenneker. Um, and I'll let you explain it a little bit, but I. Well, why do you love it? And. Mm -hmm. Um, I I love Joseph Fenneker's work because he. Mm, excuse me. He had such a beautiful way of making his figures look grotesque yet alluring. And I feel, again, I mean, a lot of these are very essentialized because he just had such a great sense of shape and design. And nearly every poster from this era, at least of his, had his you know, remarkable signature style. So he had a, a consistency, and I know you've you've talked, we've talked about that before, how one of the most important things with the body of work is that consistency and that sense of, of confidence in one's style. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't know that anyone embodied that better than Fenneker besides Luca. I mean, a lot of artists do obviously, but I, I know I'm kind of getting off on a tangent here. No, but, but he went out on a limb with it. Um, the The Reader's Digest version, for anyone who's not familiar, is that you had all of these artists doing beautiful, beautiful classical works. They went off to World War I, fought in the trenches, and when they came back, the uh, ways of illustrating were no longer valid like how do you show terror how do you show fear how do you show love and so you'd have these illustrations that were these very bold you know trying to show explosions and things like that and so expressionism grew out of that this very essentialized uh idea that's that's based in these really really bold shapes but not in the way of the macintosh where it's kind of essentialized more in um uh, you know, like this, where it's it's still very rendered. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like Cabinet of, of, of Dr. Caligari is a quintessential expressionist film. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we would love to do a Fenneker book. I would say at some point we will. Um, 
And so this was a movie written by Fritz Lang. He wrote movies, started in 1916, and I don't think he directed until 1920, maybe 1919. But at this point, he was still a writer. It's how he got his foot in the door. And uh, it's a lost, silent film about a woman who would lure men to their death. And there was like a trap door. And she had a crazy husband that was in a wheelchair. And then she lures this one man in. And she falls in love with him. And then they plot together to murder her husband instead of letting the husband murder her. So it was like a, a for this era, a rom-com, basically. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty light fare for for Berlin in 1919. So that that had to make it on the list for sure. Yes. Um, and then the next one, and, and that was in... Uh, that was in what? Uh, published in Transcendent Luxury. It's, it's a book he wrote. Uh-oh. Um, the next one is also from Transcendent Luxury. And you might be shocked to see that it is also a Joseph Fenneker artwork. Um, so this is, this is a, I mean, it's amazing. Um, this is a 1920 poster for the film, The Invisible Thief. And I, I just wanna pull these up real quick because I do have them on hand. Um, they both, both of these posters, as well as a lot of his works, um, say Marmor House on them. And so I don't know if you would like to share a little about the Marmor House just to. It was the movie theater in Berlin where uh, the best, I shouldn't say the best. I'm saying the best. Oh, oh my gosh, look at you. That's the inside of the Marmor House Theater. It was the, the place in Berlin where all the movies premiered. And Fenneker did the murals inside the theater, and he was also their in-house poster artist. And that's why you see so many Fenneker posters for films, number one, but also why they all say Marmor House. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like today where things would open up all over a country or the globe. You had a certain number of reels of film. And it would play in a city like Berlin, and then it would move out to the provinces or to other countries. Thank you. Those are more of his murals right there. So oh my God. Can you it's see? all gone. I know. It's deeply, deeply. People would always ask me questions like, because I collect so much of the German material. Oh, have you gone to Berlin? And I would always say, like, the Berlin I want to see isn't there anymore. It only exists in these old, like, these photos were in uh, a magazine or newspaper. You know, like that's all, it's all gone. I'm getting a little emotional right now. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, we have the, we have the posters. We have, yeah. this. Is a, I don't know if this is a lost movie. The other one is famously a lost movie because Fritz Lang wrote it. So everybody wants to see it and they can't. But um, this one, I don't know if it exists in some form. Or not. There were a lot of these detective adventure films at the time that were kind of like serials. Forgive me for eating chips. I was feeling <laughs> my so blood sugar got lower from it. Just started not feeling well. Um, Sean mentioned this is why Lang is the father of film noir. Very excellent point. Sean. Hi, Sean. I, just, yeah, I mean, look, he's so creepy. Creeping so around at 3 a.m. But I love this poster and we were this was probably six months ago or so we were going through what felt like our whole poster inventory and, you know, organizing and rebagging. And this was one of the posters that showed up on the table and it just, I mean, this smacks you in the face. The colors are unbelievable. It just, I, this is such an attractive poster to me, which yeah. It might seem funny, but the yellow and the blue are really interesting with that pinkish purple, mm -hmm. that mauvish color. They're, it's just not colors you would think, but it it works and it's super dimensional and dynamic in person. And yeah, yeah it's really good. Yeah, 
All right, 15 minutes. How many posters we have left? Okay. I don't know, actually. Let's see. Um, we're doing pretty well. We've got three left. All right, five minutes of poster. Let's go. What's next? Right. We've got George Dola's Damnation of Faust from 19. Mm. And this I want to hear you talk about because it's so great. So this is funny. I saw this when I was young and worked in a poster gallery. And um, I just wanted to buy it and like make payments out of my paycheck. And the short answer is the guy wouldn't let me. And I would always, when someone would like the poster, I would kind of be like, oh, you don't want that one. Like thinking I'm going to save up for it. But eventually, of course, it's sold because it's beautiful. And the thing I always loved about this, and so years later, I purchased it knowing it was not, it's not an expensive poster. Mm -hmm. It's not anything particularly special, except for the fact that it reminds me of a lot of modern rock posters. And when you turn the lights down, all of the, like the under lighting on the horse, the yellow in the sky, the color of his face, it looks like a black light poster. And so in low light, it's just, it looks like it's lit by hellfire. It's so beautiful. It is a masterwork of lithography. It is a perfect example of what you can't get when you print something in a book or you see something offset print. It, it could only look this good as a lithograph. And some of the best silk screens, when I mentioned modern rock posters, because that happens sometimes with, with great new silk screens. But it's just, uh, it feels like there's so much motion and so much dynamism um, with that lightning bolt coming in, the steam from the horse's snout, his lean forward into the, uh, into the forward motion. And again, like his face has this weird purplish color that just looks unearthly in low light. And I'll say quickly, I don't really know anything about Dola. He was, he did some posters. He was also a painter. He did really good work, but he wasn't anyone that ever particularly stood out. But I like his posters when I see them. And this is just one that I personally always loved. And I understand why you like it. It feels very, very, very modern. And of course, Damnation of Faust is a very famous opera. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And I, you know, it occurred to me when we were talking, when you were talking about it and I was looking at the horse. This looks like uh, Woody and Newt, our dogs. It does look like our dogs. <laughs> um, and but... that's Mabel riding them. <laughs> exactly. Our third little dog. Oh, yeah. But I, I, that story you told about turning the lights down and making a whole experience and enjoying it, I, I find so charming because... I love lithography and I will always go to bat for it as an art form because it is, it's nothing is like lithography. It's its own thing. And I've, I've actually never seen this in person, but I can imagine. You didn't see it when we were doing all the, po well. No, I, I don't think so. Okay. I might've done it while you were sleeping or something. Yeah, I'm, I could have also, you know, I don't remember everything. <laughs> Um, okay. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. And that, uh, that was published in Infernal Creatures. I don't know if this is actually of any use, me mentioning the book titles, but I... If someone likes the poster, there's more things like it right. in the book you mentioned. Yeah. Sure. Um, okay. This is a poster from 1925 that it's just fabulous, obviously. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. And this is uh, by an artist called Passetti. I don't know the artist's first name, but um, I, I mean, this is such a cool poster. And in person, this looks amazing. The color. There's another one that glows. It just. That and blue in the face looks like a black light poster. I mean, and it's. There's so really many dark blues in the background. 
that just reflect that give it a, a sense of three dimension. And when you see this, you guys see how dense that black, it really is that dense. I mean, this poster is like, it looks like it was painted because the, the density is so gorgeous and rich. And I love this poster because when you first look at it, you don't know what is going on. You know, is it a ghost? Is it, is somebody dancing? Is it goth Loie Fuller? What is happening right now? But, it is goth Loie Fuller. I mean, I, and I, the thing I love too about it is it's, the, this is a genderless being just, it's, it's all emotion. It's all gesture. It's all movement and color and mood. And it's, well, it's, just, it's not trying to be anything. So, she, 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 so everyone thinks of Berlin Cabaret, but the real avant-garde things were happening in Munich. Hmm. And so she was a dancer from Munich and that her stage act was just that she had this hooded thing and, and she literally was the goth Loie Fuller. She probably danced around like she was listening to Bauhaus. It was probably very Dadaist or something like that. Mm. Um, and uh, very little is known about her, but she had an extraordinary poster. And I've got like the Schnackenberg here over this shoulder, another Munich artist. She just fit right in with that sensibility that was happening in Munich around 1920. And as far as Pacetti, no one knows anything about him. Mm -hmm. Um, I've spoken with other academics. He didn't make a lot of poster art. I can't think of any others. Um, he might have been, it's very likely that he would have been someone that probably was a set designer or worked in some other element of the theater and then happened to make a poster. Um, yeah. How cool. Sean says Studio Ghibli via Expressionism, kind of Martha Grammish. I mean, it does make sense, definitely. Yeah, it is. Well, that's why I like this one over my shoulder here. Mm -hmm. I always felt like that looked very anime-ish. So it's just surprising how modern some of these things can feel. Oh yeah, I love that. Was a finalist on the list too. There, I feel like we could just keep going on and on. There, there can't be a top ten. It's just there's so much. Magnificent art. Okay. Last one. Well, next we'll do your top 10 silent film posters, and then we can do your top 10 cabaret posters. Oh my gosh. That would be good. All right. Drum roll, please. Okay, the next one is from 1971. We're flying into the future here. And it's good old Simon King of the Witches. So I... I'm seeing a pattern with your interest in psychedelia. I, I know. Between I the know. wall behind you and yes. Chopin and this one. I think what it is is um, the surrealness and uh, paired with the act of artfully making reality more fantastic and humorous and and terrifically displayed and um i i just this is a poster that i've always loved i've personally taken it to shows with me and actually made an effort to try to find it a home and you know when I would take other, this is a 40 inch by 60 inch poster. So it is massive. Very large. And you know, people, a lot of people love Simon King of the Witches. Obviously it's amazing. And I don't know if they love the movie. No, the poster. I think they love the poster. Yeah, the poster. That's of course, yes. And you know, the more time that goes by, the less willing I am to part with this because I, you know, I was thinking about it this is just one of the coolest film posters I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, I, I'm not all about like cult leaders or anything like that, but it's, it's just the design and the, the color choices on this are just perfect. 
and, and everything about it. It feels occult. It feels psychedelic. It feels 70s. I mean, it's very 1971. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is the scale of it. The fact that it's so big really helps because that wavy pattern uh, feels very enveloping. Mm -hmm. And the figure then when it's hung and he's above eye level and the altar is kind of, you know, just below eye level, it, it all feels very uh, dynamic. There's a lot of presence for this art. But I, I thought that we, yeah, we decided that we're going to retire this one and put it in your office there. It goes with your walls. I've got a lot of enormous artworks. to. That's the thing that even like with Fenneker, I thought years ago that I'd be dealing in that kind of material, but it was so hard to sell. Everybody loved it, but people wanted to buy things that were prettier or simpler. And so, uh, you know, I just wound up collecting that more. And same thing with this, like everyone loves it, but it's pristine condition. It's incredibly rare. And so people want it, but you know, they want it to be $15 and you know, that can't happen. No. Um, okay. yeah. There you have it. So there, there were definitely artworks that have not yet been published. And so I, I definitely got an opportunity to think about you know, some of the artworks that I know we love and that I know. Which, which book is this in? This is in Infernal Creatures. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I lied. Beautiful Macabre. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me to say that. Which we are doing a uh, hardcover edition of at the end of this year. You heard it here. Yeah. Yeah. We generally don't want to do that. It's not like. You know, we want there to be a better version later, but we published it so many years ago mm -hmm. and we're down to literally just a handful of copies. And instead of reprinting it in paperback, we thought it'd be nice to maybe blow it up in size a little bit and do it in the format that we're trying to adopt more, which is that Berlin Girls uh, Infernal Creatures format, where it's just a little bit larger and in that nice cloth bound spine and so yeah, so we're going to do a Kickstarter for that this fall. I'm really looking forward to it. And I uh, I agree, Forrest, uh, it's kitsch, but in a sinister way. And uh, There's one other poster that looks like this in terms of being really, really psychedelic. And it's the big 40 by 60 for Barbarella. I love Barbarella art. I'm 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 not picturing the one you're talking about, but I've probably seen it. I just that I remember those posters being really cool. Um, we have uh, two minutes left. All right. Um, I am so sorry. I know I'm going to say your name wrong, and I'm sure you get it all the time, which makes me feel that much worse. It's but pronounced Tom. <laughs> Dasazia, this salon has been so great. Kat. You've asked her that before. I know we have. That's, you know, I'm going to just sleep outside tonight. Um, thank you for um, for your comment. And uh, silent film and cabaret posters, top 10 for sure. We will definitely keep that. I mean, that, that sounds like a good. It would be super, super fun. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, and if you haven't watched any of these before, we're just trying to, to recreate what it was like to be in the gallery, especially after hours and just, you know, the ability to be able to walk around and look at the art and talk about it. And so we're just trying to make ourselves available and, uh, you know, engage you guys in, in sharing what some of the things are that you love. So, um, yeah, please email us at salon at centuryguild.net if there's anything you want to see or just comment on uh, social media or YouTube. I guess YouTube might be social media. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep uh, we'll keep trying to, to be entertaining. Definitely. Yes, we'll see your comments. We'll see your emails. And um, we will definitely. Hi, Charles. Go ahead, Charles. Hi, Charles. Dasazia. Wow. Dasazia. 
Shazia. The Shazia. The Shazia. Oh my God. I'm totally sleeping. Um, <laughs> thank you. If you're, if you're here with us right now, thank you so much for watching. And if you've commented, thank you guys for being part of the discussion. And if you're watching this after the fact, thank you for tuning in. Yeah. Thank and, you for being here. Um, we're going to be back next month. Uh, first Thursday of the month, and um, we will be announcing next month's topic um, as well. But in the meantime, we are all ears. If you have anything you'd like to see, you know, please, again, like Tom said, send us an email, leave a comment. And then there is also a link in the description if you see any artworks that you felt inspired by and want to see more like it, um, you can order the book it's from through the link in the description. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. <laughs>